The real reason some World War II underground shelters stayed cool even in the worst summer heat is one of those forgotten engineering tricks that deserves far more attention than it gets. People walked into these bunkers expecting oven-like temperatures, only to find air that felt shockingly mild. Veterans later described it as standing in a stone fridge, even when the surface was baking. And this wasn't magic, and it wasn't luck. It was a deliberate method, built quietly into the dirt and timber, relying on something far older than modern HVAC. In this episode, we're reconstructing the actual system, running real temperature comparisons, and uncovering the remarkable cooling effects that turned raw earth into a dependable, low-energy heatsink. If you've ever wondered how wartime engineers kept personnel functional, stored food safely, and protected equipment without electricity, this is the kind of deep dive you'll want to stick around for. The foundation of the system was the Earth itself functioning as a massive thermal battery. World War II engineers understood something that many modern survivalists rediscover the hard way. Once you dig deep enough, the ground stops caring about the weather above. Soil, only a few feet below the surface, tends to stabilize close to the annual mean temperature of the region. That means a shelter in a temperate area might sit at a natural 12 to 15 degrees Celsius, even when the outside air hits 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. World War II planners took full advantage of this. By excavating shelters to a depth where the surrounding soil acted as a natural temperature reservoir, they created an environment buffered from rapid heating. The deeper the wall contact, the more stable the interior climate. You know, this is why many of the best-performing defensive and civilian bunkers weren't necessarily the ones with the thickest concrete. The real secret lay in those with the most soil mass directly against the living space. The thickness of the earth itself acted as a kind of thermal sponge, absorbing heat slowly and releasing it even more slowly. Quite fascinating, isn't it? Now, if you're studying fortification design today, or perhaps considering building a modern off-grid shelter, that principle still holds true. A personal application, for example, would be to bury a root cellar-style room at least one meter below grade. Just make sure those walls remain in full contact with compacted soil. Interestingly, you don't really need electricity for stability. You just need mass. Cooling performance? Well, it increased dramatically once airflow channels were added. You see, underground temperature alone won't create comfort unless there's some mechanism to move air. W. Wu designers, clever as they were, solved this by using long, narrow intake passages combined with exit flues placed at slight elevation differences. Warm air rises even underground, and they ingeniously used that principle to coax air through the shelter without fans. Quite brilliant, really. When air travelled through a long, soil-lined intake tunnel, it had time to shed heat into the surrounding earth. By the time it entered the central chamber, it arrived noticeably cooler. Tests in reconstructed sections of wartime shelters consistently show that air passing through a six to eight meter intake corridor can drop between five and ten degrees Celsius before reaching the living area, depending on soil moisture and compaction. Moist but dense soil improves conduction and makes the cooling more efficient. 
If you wanted to replicate this with modern materials, you could run a buried PVC or clay pipe intake channel at a gentle downward slope, allowing the earth to strip heat from incoming air before it enters a bunker, workshop or root cellar. The principle remains unchanged. The layout of rooms mattered more than most people expect. One overlooked detail in wartime engineering reports is how rooms were positioned relative to the airflow. Central chambers were always placed behind the longest stretch of earth, while storage or auxiliary rooms were positioned near the warmer exterior ends. This meant people slept, worked and stayed in the coolest zones, while heat-producing activities, cooking, mechanical repairs, equipment operation, were kept closer to the air outlets or in semi-separate compartments. So, this same principle translates cleanly to today's off-grid building. If you're constructing an underground shelter, you'll want to keep your main living areas deepest in the heat sink zone. And if you need a generator room, chemical storage area, or perhaps a workshop, it's best to put them near the exit flue so the heat they produce naturally travels outward. Now, soil layers above the shelter acted as a passive insulating blanket. Many World War II bunkers used layered backfill above the roof. First coarse rubble, then packed loam, and finally sod. Engineers weren't doing that for camouflage alone. Each layer slowed conductive heat transfer in a different way. The rubble created air pockets that resisted quick heating, while the loam held moisture and provided slow thermal diffusion. The sod layer, surprisingly, often made the largest difference. Living vegetation shaded the roof and stabilised temperature swings. When reconstructing these systems for modern testing, the shelters with vegetation cover routinely outperformed those with bare soil by several degrees. If you were applying this now, you could simply mound a two-layer system over your underground room, a gravel layer for drainage and a packed soil layer seeded with hardy ground cover. You don't need wartime resources to get wartime results. This system offered reliable low-energy climate control that still works today. What stands out most when you study these shelters is how effective they were despite having zero-powered cooling systems. Some performed well enough to store perishables that would otherwise spoil within days. Others served as summer command centers precisely because soldiers could think clearly in them, even during heat waves. In practical survival terms, these principles can be used to design a modern backyard emergency shelter that stays cool without electricity. Start by digging deep enough to hit stable soil temperature. Build walls that maintain good soil contact, run at least one long buried intake chute. Place your main living area behind the thickest earth mass and cover the roof with layered soil and vegetation. Even in hot climates, this combination can maintain functional working temperatures. If you've watched this far, you already know how different W2 engineering looks when you break it down layer by layer. The underground heatsink system wasn't luck, myth or coincidence. It was a disciplined approach to climate control built from nothing more than soil, geometry and airflow. If you value deep historical engineering knowledge with real survival applications, Make sure you subscribe to Warfield Survival, share this episode with fellow history buffs, and help keep these forgotten techniques alive.